Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our NPC Online Bible Study. I'm Matthew McGlade, the lead and teaching pastor here at Mansfield Pentecostal Church, where every Tuesday night we have our thought to think about, a question to ponder, a text to study, and we are continuing our Bible study series titled Journeying Through the Hebrew Bible. And uh, what we're doing, we're, we're going to be doing a survey of the individual books of the Hebrew Bible and uh, how they affect us, how they impact upon our lives. Uh, just as a, a caveat, you remember that when I use the term Hebrew Bible, I'm also referring to the Old Testament. So sometimes I'm going to be using these terms interchangeably through, through this. Now what we've been doing over these uh, last couple of weeks, uh, before we actually start looking at the individual books, of the Old Testament. We are, we've been looking at the general big story of the Old Testament and what we're going to do tonight is that we're going to finish that off uh, and then we're going to look at the very, we're do, going to do a brief overview of the books of the Hebrew Bible and how they fit into the big story. Uh, you also remember we said that the Hebrew Bible is important for us as Christians because without it we can make no sense of the New Testament whatsoever. We said that it provides the literary and the historical and the theological uh, bedrock of the New Testament. So, you know, people talk about trying to ditch the Old Testament. That's a complete nonsense. You can't have the New Testament without the Old Testament. So we need to be familiar with the story of the Old Testament and its significance for us to truly grasp the significance of our Christian faith. Now, you'll remember uh, that last, last few sessions we've looked from Adam all the way to this guy called Zerubbabel. And uh, what we're going to be doing tonight, we're going to be moving, uh, we've looked at that in five parts, but tonight we're going to take it up from, from the last time and we're going to look from Zerubbabel uh, to, to Christ. And we're looking from the years 359 or 300, sorry, let's get this right, 539 BC, all the way to the year zero and to the time of Christ. And then during this time, the Babylonian Empire, which we looked at last week, had, uh, had, had fallen, had declined, and a new empire had come to power known as the Empire of the Medes and the Persians. Uh, and the Medes and the Persians were, the first king of the Medes and the Persians was a king by the name of Cyrus. Cyrus is actually spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, someone who had come to power, who would be a key instrument of the Lord in, in allowing the Jewish exiles to return back to the homeland. Now Cyrus, as, as the first king of the Persians and the Medes, adopted the policy of tolerance towards all the peoples that he ruled. And he believed that it was okay for different peoples to worship the various gods in different ways. And so one of the first things he did was that he allowed the Jewish people permission to go back to the homeland in, in Judea or, or uh, sorry, in, in Judea or, uh, or Judah, I should say, and, and at Jerusalem and rebuild the, the temple and to practice the worship of their God in, in the city of Jerusalem. And this came in fulfillment to the, pro to the prophecy that, that Jeremiah had made about 70 years previous. And so over the next 100 years, three groups of Jewish exiles would come back uh, from the land of Babylon back to, back to Jerusalem. And uh, the first group of exiles was led by the name, a man by the name of Zerubbabel. And uh, his name means uh, seed of Babel, as far as I know. And uh, Zerubbabel was actually a descendant of King David. And himself and the priest by the name of Joshua, they came back to Jerusalem at the time of that Cyrus issued the decree. And their first task was to rebuild the temple of God that had been destroyed by the Babylonians 70 years previously. Uh, during that time, they experienced opposition from the locals to, and they stopped building the temple. But then during the, during the ministry of the prophets Haggai and Zechariah, they were encouraged to rebuild the temple. Sometime after Zerubbabel, uh, there was another man by the name of Ezra. He was a priest, but also a teacher of the Bible. And he came back uh, to Jerusalem to teach God's people the ways of God and how they should live. Uh, and so there was a restoration of the worship of God and the rebuilding of the temple. There was also a restoration of how the people should live their lives through Ezra and the teaching that he brought. And then sometime later, 
another man by the name of Nehemiah. He was a cupbearer to King Artaxerxes uh, of the Persians and Medes, and he had in his heart a, bur a burden to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. And so he returned, and he also rebuilt uh, he rebuilt the civil life of, of the city of Jerusalem and rebuilding the walls. Um, and so we see that there's a spiritual restoration. And there is a restoration and the learning of the people in terms of learning the ways of God. And there's a civil and civic restoration and the rebuilding of, of the walls of Jerusalem. And that happened in the period of about three, 300 years, uh, sorry, 100 years. But what's significant is that when the Jewish people are being restored back to the homeland, uh, when things are beginning to restore, it's very clear that the restoration of the Jewish people was not like that it used to be under the rule and the reign of King David. And so the um, Bible records, even the book of Ezra, that when the, the, um, the, the descendants, when they came back and they saw the temple being rebuilt, they, we they wept and they mourned because it, they remember from their childhood years the glory of Solomon's temple, and it wasn't like what it used to be. Well, for a period of time, uh, the, the, the Jewish exiles or the Jewish people who came back uh, to 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 the land of Judah and to the land of, and to the city of Jerusalem, uh, their their faith in God became more of a religious formality than an actual relationship, and uh, sadly through the prophet Malachi, uh, God spoke to His people, and after the prophet Malachi, God no longer spoke to His people for a period of four hundred years. Now, over these next 400 years, a number of events were, would happen that were very significant to the Jewish people that would arrive until the time of Christ. Greek philosophy started to take hold in ancient Greece. Uh, so we had the likes for Aristotle, Plato, um, uh, Socrates were the Greek philosophers of their day that had an impact upon Western civilization in the East. We had the, the likes of Eastern uh, philosophy under, under Buddha and Confucius. Uh, and that, that held quite strong pr prominence in the land of China. The Persian Empire continued to grow in influence and power during this time. But then from the West, a certain king by the name of Alexander the Great of, of Greece, he conquered and, de and defeated the Persians in, a, in the year 330 BC in the Battle of Esuas. And so the, the power shifted from Persia to the Greek Empire. But after the, the premature death of Alexander the Great, the new empire that Alexander had conquered was split into four separate kingdoms, or four separate Greek kingdoms. And the land of Israel, the land of Judah, was, uh, was sort of in between two of these kingdoms. To the south, of Judah was the land of, was what we call the Ptolemaic kingdom of Egypt and to the north was the Seleucid kingdom and each and Israel was sort of caught as a piggy in the middle as it were between these two kingdoms um, and during that time sadly the Jewish people were were tempted to abandon their their roots and their faith in God to adopt the Hellenistic and Greek culture and the Greek lifestyle um, one of the kings at that time was a king by the name of Atonicus Epiphanes. And uh, he persecuted the Jewish people and he, he desecrated the temple of God in Jerusalem to try to force them to abandon their faith in God and to worship the Greek gods and of the Greek culture. Well, fortunately, the Jewish people resisted him. They stood up against the, that Greek culture. And many Jews uh, stood for their faith and for, and for their walk with God. But eventually a new power came from the West, and that was the Roman Empire. And they came to power in about 60 BC. They invaded what we know now as the Promised Land. And so we see that there was a, a sort of partial restoration of the Jewish people uh, during, during that time. But they were sort of caught in between these various powers that were happening throughout the Middle East during, during that age. And the theme of this story and theme of this part of the story is that God restored his people as he had promised when they repented and turned back to him. And that was preparing a way for the Messiah to come. And so as we come to the close of the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, 
we begin to realize that the problem of sin right from the very beginning still isn't resolved. God's image in the human race is still needs to be res restored. All that happened, um, all that has happened is that God is going to reveal his plan to his people of how he's going to solve the problem in the human race. And that is through the coming Messiah. And so the, the people were anticipating a time when the Messiah would come and restore the kingdom back to the glory days of, of David. There was still a hope in the Jewish people that, that, um, that someone would come and uh, bring the promise of God's salvation, not just for the Jewish people, but for the whole, all the inhabitants of the earth. And that's why Jesus had to be born. And so as we close the Old Testament, in many ways, we're, we're left with an incomplete answer. Um, and the answer can go one of two ways. It could either go in the path of rabbinic Judaism, which was seen in the tradition of the Pharisees, and, and we see that in the Jewish writings later on, what we call the Jewish Mishma and the Talmud, and the hope that the Messiah would soon come, or the hope of the Old Testament is fulfilled in the birth of Jesus and the beginning of the New Testament, uh, which is what we have as Christians. And so as we go through this story of the Old Testament, uh, I'm, I'm going to take that latter approach. I'm going to show why actually Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament and he is the fulfillment of the Hebrew Scriptures. And why actually that when we read the Old Testament and the lens of the New Testament, it actually makes so much more sense and it actually enriches our faith. Now, we've looked at the big story of the Hebrew Bible, and we looked at the various, but what I want to do now is I want to look at the books of the Hebrew Bible and how they fit into the story. Now, when we open up our, our Old Testaments, you will notice that there are about 39 different books of the Old Testament. Uh, and very often they are they are divided into four genres of literature or four sections. The first part is what we call the law or the Pentateuch or the Torah. And the word Torah simply means teaching or instruction. And in this part of the Bible, we have five, the five books of Moses. And they're called the books of Moses because they believed to be originally written by the prophet Moses. So we've got Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And they were written by Moses about 1400 BC. The next part of our Old Testament is then what we call the historic books. So we've got the books of Joshua, written by Joshua, Judges and Ruth, most likely written by Samuel. First and second Samuel, again, this would have been written by Samuel, but also Nathan and the prophets Nathan and Gad. Then we got first and second Kings, uh, which have been written by the prophets, most likely by the prophets Jer uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah. First and second Chronicles, which would have comp been compiled by the Bible teacher Ezra. And then we've also got Ezra, Nehemiah and Esther, uh, which was most likely written by, by Ezra. And, and these writings, what we call the historic books, were, were written from about 1380 to 474 BC. Then we've got also a poetry section in the Hebrew Bible. So these books uh, were not read, written at any spe specified time, but they were recorded throughout Israel's history. So the book of Job, we don't know who was the author of Job, um, but it's actually one of the oldest books that we have in the Old Testament, it was probably written even before the book of, of Genesis. We have the book of Psalms, uh, for which David is the main contributor, but we also have writings from the sons of Korah and Moses and Solomon. We have the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon that was written by Solomon himself, but also later edited by King Hezekiah. Then we have what we call the major and the minor prophets. Now the major prophets, they're called the major prophets, not because what the message they bring is any more, more important than the minor prophets, but purely because their writings contain the large bulk of the writings of the prophets. So these include Isaiah, 
uh, who is the major, uh, who are one of the largest prophets that were written of. In fact, you often find that in the New Testament, where lots of references are made to Isaiah, and because Isaiah was such a, a, a large prophet, very often uh, when the New Testament writers were referring to Isaiah, they were using his name to be inclusive of all the prophets of the Old Testament. But we also have Jeremiah, who is a significant contributor, and Lamentations. Both the prophets, both Jeremiah and Lamentations were written by Jeremiah uh, and his scribe Baruch. Uh, Ezekiel was written by Ezekiel. Daniel, again, was recorded by Daniel, but was possibly edited later by others. Um, and the writings of these major prophets were written between 5, 739 to 53, um, 530 BC. And then we also have the minor prophets. Uh, these, again, emphasize the point they're not less important than what they say. It's just that the, the content of their writings is smaller than that of the major prophets. And so we have the works of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And again, they were written between 730 to 5, uh, sorry, the 435 BC. Now, that's the books of the Old Testament in our um, modern translations. What I want to show you now also is how the books of the Bible are arranged in the Hebrew Bible, okay, or the Jewish uh, version of what we call our Old Testaments. And I want you to notice that there are two main differences between how the books of the Hebrew Bible are arranged to what we have in our Old Testaments. And the first thing I want you to notice is what well, a few things I want you to notice is firstly, there is no more or fewer books. There is exactly the same uh, books that we have in our Old Testaments as the Jews have in their Hebrew Bible, except that they arrange them differently and they've combined books in different ways. So, for example, we still have the Torah or the law or the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. But there's a, the main difference is that instead of having what we call the historic books, the Jews have what they call the former prophets and the later prophets. And so in the former prophets, they have Joshua, Judges, Samuel, 1st and 2nd Samuel, and Kings, 1st and 2nd Kings. And you'll notice that they've combined 1st and 2nd Kings into one book, 1st and 2nd Samuel into one book. Okay, So that's combined into one book. Then secondly, they have what we call the later prophets. So instead of us having the major and the minor prophets, they just have something called the later prophets. So the later prophets include Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and then uh, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And you may be wondering why Matthew are... The, is Joshua, Judges, Samuel, why, and Kings, why are they included in the prophets? Why do they call them former prophets? Well, the reason they call them the prophets is because the Jewish people believe that they were written as history with prophetic interpretation, and they were actually written and compiled by the prophets, uh, by people who were prophetically anointed. So as well as the Torah, as well as the prophets, the Jews have also arranged the books according to the writings as well. So the writings include the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job. They also include the Song of Solomon, the Book of Ruth, um, which is sometimes combined with the Book of Judges, but, but, but Ruth mainly, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. And so you'll notice that the, the way that the Jewish people have arranged the Hebrew Bible is different to our Old Testament. But the key thing you'll notice is that exactly the same books are in the Jewish Bible as, a, as there is in our Old Testament, but they're arranged differently. In fact, the, um, in fact they, so they're arranged in what we call the, the Torah, the writings, and, the, and so the prophets and the writings. In fact, the Hebrew term... Uh, for the Hebrew Bible, it was called the Ketavim, okay? Uh, and so uh, so the, it refers, uh, sorry, not the Ketavim, the, the Tanakh. So the Tanakh refers to the Torah, uh, the writing, the prophets, and the writings. 
And so, so the, 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 there are exactly the same books as we have in our Old Testament, but they're just in a different order. And you'll notice that some of the larger books on our Hebrew, uh, our Old Testament, have been combined in the one book. And so that's why there appear to be a slightly fewer books in the, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible than our Old Testament. So where then, we've been looking at the story of the Old Testament. We've divided that into six parts. And what I'm going to do is just really quickly look at how the various parts of the, the Hebrew Bible or the books of the Hebrew Bible fit into that story. And so you remember from part one, from Adam to Noah, is mainly Genesis 1 to 9. In part 2, from Noah to Abraham is Genesis 9, 10 to 11. In part 3, from Abraham to Moses is, is from Genesis 12 to Exodus 1. In part 6 or 4, from Moses to King David, we have the, with Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, uh, and then the historical books, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel. And then part five from King David, the Zerubbabel, is the bulk of the books of the Hebrew Bible. So we have first and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah. And as you can see, the bulk of the books of the Hebrew Bible fit into this part as well. Daniel sort of overlaps with parts five and six of the big story of the Bible. So in part six, we then have Zerubbabel to Christ. So that includes Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, and also the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And so you'll also notice that when I've included the books of the Hebrew Bible in these various parts, I've not mentioned the Psalms uh, or the wisdom books, mainly because the, the Psalms were written uh, over an extended period of times throughout the, throughout the history of the Jewish people. And so as we come to a close to our introduction to the Hebrew Bible, over these next few weeks and possibly months, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to take you through individual books of the Hebrew Bible, and we're going to look at them, and uh, uh, we're going to see uh, how, what, is the, what is the main emphasis of each of these books, what can we learn from them, as, 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 as Christians. And as I take you through the books of the Hebrew Bible, I will be taking you through them in the order of the Jewish Bible or the Hebrew Bible, not in the order of our English Bibles or Old Testaments. And uh, there is a reason for that because I actually think um, that, the, that, that there's something that we can draw out from as believers in Christ by uh, looking at the arrangement of the books of the Hebrew Bible in the order that the Jew Jewish people uh, read, read them. And so that's what we're going to be doing over these uh, weeks and months uh, as we uh, unpack pack this. Guys, well, that's our thought to think about. A question to ponder in our life groups is, do you have a favorite book in the Old Testament? What is it and why? And also the text study I'd like you to read, look at Ezekiel chapter 37 verses 1 to 14. Uh, from reading the text, uh, what was the gathering of the bones meant to represent? So from reading the text, what was the gathering of the bones meant to re represent? Well, guys, hope you got something out of that tonight. Hey, listen, have a great rest of the week, and I'm looking forward to next week. Next week, we're going to look at how the actual books of the, uh, of the Old Testament came together, how we actually got them, and then we're going to start to look at the individual books. God bless you all.